Hey, it's Richard Geller. I hope your day is going really, really well. I'm here with Alan Schnur. How are you doing, Alan? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you. We're on this fantastic next section of this. We've been talking about the uh, your first apartment deal. And we've been using this example of Casa Bonita. And last time when we got together, we talked about various steps. We're going to uh, pre-purchase, closing, rehab, lease up, and maybe a further step of managing it and managing other people's properties. And um, so we got a lot to cover today, and we're going to start covering it um, right now. Just to kind of take you up to date, let's open this guy up here. Uh, we talked about last time about A, B, C, and D properties and about how it's really better to stick to what, um, B and C, basically? Yeah, that, we, 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 want, we want to stay away from the D properties. And, you know, the Casa Benita story, the one that we're talking about today is a C property in a D neighborhood. I mean, that's what you really want to find. Um, you don't have to go into old, um, dangerous neighborhoods to get a good deal. We got a great deal in a C building in a D class neighborhood. Yeah. And then we're, we talked about finding deals like this and specifically how to locate them through brokers and find sellers who are motivated. And we're going to be doing some more on finding properties in the future, but we did cover uh, a lot of this and, and finding out their motivation, why they're selling and then meeting their requirements. So you can generally close and get a really, really good deal for yourself. And, right. um, and then we started talking about the letter of intent and the letter of intent is what we're going to be starting on today. Because what you want to do, we said, is you want to get one or two letters of intent out or LOIs a week if you can, because you're going to build a whole pipeline of deals that way and you're going to become filthy rich and have a great time in the rest of your life. So um, <laughs> we hope. So, <laughs> uh, and, and an LOI is going to buy you credibility. It's going to buy you some time. And it's the next step in your closing on your first apartment deal. Further to that, we're going to be talking about, you know, in the future, we'll talk about the closing, the rehab, the lease up and, and all of that. So let's get to the LOI. And I think what might help us is to take a quick look again at the property that we were talking about, that we are talking about here. Um, okay, yeah. So you're going to pull it up. This is there the Casa Benita story. This is a 39-unit deal. And um, it's, it's not on the water, but it's across the street from the water here in Texas. And um, it's, in, it's in a great neighborhood. It's just a fantastic neighborhood. It's not too far away from the Space Center, uh, Johnson uh, Space Center. And um, there's just tens of thousands of jobs down that way. And it's, uh, the energy business has a lot to do um, with that area as well. So this is your typical C-class building. Um, this particular owner just wanted to move up and do other things. So a lot of us start off buying small apartment complexes. I have. This is one of them. And then we, we move up the food chain. And um, so what everyone's looking at right now is the before pictures. This is how I bought it. And I'm actually in the middle of the rehab right now, so I can't wait to show you some new pictures in this presentation or the next presentation. But um, look, the process starts with a broker, and the process starts with an LOI, and we're going to go through more of that today. Um, 39 units, there's six efficiencies in the back, and um, there's nine townhomes in here, which is kind of interesting, too, because we can get a lot more money for the townhomes, and um, it's an awesome situation, a cute little deal that it's really easy to wrap your hands around. For the people that have done single-family house deals before and have been thinking about moving on to multifamily apartment buildings, this is the perfect situation. And, you know, it's, it's our intentions here to help you cross over the line, get away from, you know, slowly building up your housing portfolio, slowly building up your retirement plan, and dive in, buy a 39-unit deal and get 39 checks instead of, you know, just one or two from a house. I like that. And uh, this is how you started. Um, you started in houses, and I know you've told the story before, and you have – a large number of houses, more than a few. <laughs> I have a hundred houses, and I, I have this saying um, that that I have a hundred unit complex, and I made more money, and I continue to make more money with a hundred unit complex that took me less than realistically thirty or sixty days to close and own and run. Um, I make more money in in one month of work or two months of work than ten years of buying a hundred houses, which I still own. 
So a decade versus a month or two. I want everyone to get on the fast track. So a 39-unit building, what we're talking about today is the way to do it. Yeah, it really is, um, especially if you've ever tried to sell 100 houses. Um. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm trying to refinance 100 houses right now, and it, it's not fun. No, no. Uh, so the point is that you really face a lot less competition in this apartment business the way we're talking about doing it. So we're not talking about doing six or eight units because you're going to get a lot of the house people in your uh, town who are going to be pursuing right. these small deals. And we're not talking about 200 or 300 units because you're going to get these hedge funds and these larger well-heeled uh, capital raising companies making offers on those. We're talking about this mid-range here, um, a little bigger than what your guy in town is going to take down who's just getting out of houses and a little smaller than the hedge fund and the uh, real estate investment trust guys are going to want. And that's really a sweet spot for us right now. So you don't want to be afraid of pursuing a deal with 30, 40, 50, 60 units. You really don't. It's fear that's keeping everybody back and it's keeping them into these rehabs and wholesaling where they make two or $3,000 and really, really work hard. Um, and if I could just add to that, Richard, because it is this fear that holds everybody back and you know maybe lending is one of those fears. Local bankers are in love with these sub deals that we're talking about, these, these $3 million or less deals. Um, they love lending. It's easier to borrow money on a 39-unit apartment building than it is on a house or two. And this is what your local banks are looking for. They're, they're looking for you more than you're looking for them. So, again, you just need to take this knowledge that we're talking about, the lingo, get comfortable to the conversation, and believe you can do it, and you can, and the money will follow. I mean, again, it's easier to borrow money from a local bank buying a 39-unit building than a single family house. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it reminded me when we were just, just covering that of that uh, Rodney Dangerfield's remark in Caddyshack is one of my favorite movies. He, you know, he says, Hey, you want to make $14 the hard way? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, great movie. That's kind yeah. of what the, the house guys are making it the hard way. You know, uh, it, it's they terrible. are. I mean, I'm, I'm living proof. I mean, uh, I haven't been in, in this business, the, 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 real, the apartment house business, for more than three or four years now, and we're finally crossing 1,200 units. Um, but my wealth, my, I realized a lot of wealth immediately once I got involved in the apartment buildings, and I did not realize wealth very quickly in the single-family house business for over a decade. Wow. <laughs> wow. So yeah. let's, let's make it the easy way here, the easy way. So yes. <laughs> So I'm a little bit uh, confused. We have a lot of questions that have been coming in. And one okay. of them is, when do you do a drive-by? When do you visit the property? Is this before or after you do an LOI? Because I don't really understand that. Well, it, it, it really depends. I mean, I would suggest our listeners do it before if they can, because I want to make sure that, that they're not wasting their time. Um, because you're going to be creating new relationships with new brokers. And what the brokers really want to see, most of all, is your desire and your effort and the time you're going to put into the deal. So if you give them that, then they're going to they're going to they're going to help you get the deal. But if you're just blindly sending out LOIs, mm, you might fall into another pool of people that they don't take seriously. It does work both ways. Um, I'm selling a property right now. Um, Twelve LOIs came back on this one property that we're selling, wow. and there's one that I, there's one that I like the best. And I just found out last night, Richard, that that the buyer hasn't visited the property yet. And I was very disappointed to hear that. I mean, how could you? I'm looking at 12 potential buyers on one property, and the one that I like the best hasn't visited the property. So he's obviously sending them out blindly. So he, he's, in my, he's in my favorite buyers right now. But um, I think our listeners, I don't want anyone to waste their time. So drive the property that you like or, you know, and you just show up. Maybe pretend you want to rent a unit or just drive by it. Um, maybe you can talk to people in the surrounding area, but get involved. Well, you learn a lot when you do that. And you, right. it's sort of like um, trying to study geography in class versus going and visiting a country. You just pick up a lot when you're on the ground. So your education is going to be furthered by doing that. How far away from your house or from where you work, how far away do you want to be looking? This is a major question. We got uh, several questions like this. It's really up to the individual. Um, I have properties that are 10 miles away from where I live 
or 75 miles away from where I live. And what I like to do is I like to focus on an area and say, let me build a base. Like there's, there's some properties that I own that are 30, 40 miles away. And I bought a few. I started with one, but then I bought a few of them. And once I had three or four in one area, I picked one individual to oversee all three or four. Um, so it's really, I mean, it depends. If a person is driving to work every day, um, maybe you buy something that's on the way to work or not too far from work. It's really up to the individual. Well, and then we have people in Manhattan. We have people in Washington, D.C. We have people in L.A. There's situations here in Manhattan you may not buy an apartment building in Manhattan at all. You may have to go to New Jersey or Long Island or somewhere right. else. If you're in L.A., you may have to go long distances depending on where you live. And if you're in Washington, D.C., you know, it depends where you are. you, you got to be very careful. So uh, this is a, an important point because how easy is it to do a deal 75 miles away? I mean, every time you have to visit the property, is going to take, you know, your whole day, basically, travel time and all that. Is that really practical, Alan? No, it, it, it's not practical. And I really would like to see our first-time apartment buyer buy something close to where they're going to be. Um, I don't want to see anyone driving, you know, half a day to check up on their apartment building. Maybe 50 miles, 20 miles, yeah, something like, like that. that. You know, that miles. would be the max. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially your and, first uh, once you bit, now once you get critical mass, uh, it's different. And and I suppose if you have to drive and you have to go to an area because you just, ha you know, where you live, your situation, you certainly want to go to an area where there's lots and lots of apartment buildings. And at least then you may have to work really hard and do a lot of driving at the beginning, but then you're going to be able to have feet on the ground, people there, and it's going to be a lot easier to buy your second, third, and fourth building there. And hey, Richard, what some of my students do is um, they live far, say they live 75 miles away from something that they want to buy, but they partner up with somebody that lives in the area or um, is closer to that apartment building than, than they are. So um, that's a great reason to partner up with somebody. Okay, that's a fantastic idea. Okay. And uh, we got a lot of questions on financing. And I just want to briefly kind of explain or talk about this because we're going to be showing you an LOI in a moment. And uh, you know, one of the things we're going to be covering is financing. In fact, why don't we bring that LOI up right now and start talking about okay. that LOI? Okay. Let's do that. Let me warn everybody, the LOI that we're about to bring up is for a large apartment complex that I'm um, right now trying to buy. So we sent it out this week, and uh, it's interesting. Um, it's, in, it's an REO deal, so the bank took it back, and they're just taking – it's like an auction. So they're taking bids. So they're collecting LOIs, just like I said before. So they're probably – the brokers will collect probably 10 to 12 LOIs and um, just go through the process of elimination and come down to, you know, the three or four that are, are the most serious and the most qualified. And, okay, so there it is. The letter you you really can't. Well, I, I want to touch on that yeah. another moment. You can't, you can't okay. be scared. You can't be scared of No. You, listen, you, you have to be in it to win it, or then a lottery saying, you got to you got, you got to start working on your pipeline. Um, you got to get off the fence, and you got to start sending in LOIs and, I know I just said it'd be a good idea if you can drive every property first before you send in an LOI, but I need you to do a deal. I need everyone to start doing deals. So if sending in LOIs just to get your feet wet, well, then do that. Um, I remember before I finished college, I actually started interviewing for jobs, not to get the job, but just to start the process and get used to it. I need you to start the process and get used to it because – once the learning curve kicks in, you're going to explode. You're, you're, you'll never return back to the same person that you are, and you'll see huge opportunities to make huge amounts of money. Okay, Richard. And, and, and if you've got 12 LOIs, and you mentioned 12 several times, right. Right. It, it gives you about an 8% chance just randomly of getting the deal. So if you've got 12 LOIs okay. out, <clears throat> chances are one of them is right. going to be accepted if it's a decent LOI. What is it that makes the LOI interesting to you as a, as a seller? and not interesting? Like, what do you do to put them in the good pile or put them in the bad pile? Well, first of all, um, there is no, a lot of deals right now are being presented with no sales price. Ooh. So um, it takes a little research to figure out what things are, are selling at in the area, and your broker will help you with figuring that out. 
So, you know, this particular, I hope, I hope Heller's not listening to this, this recording right now, but this particular deal is probably worth thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a unit. As you can see, number one, my price, I started off with a $32,000 unit price tag. It's approximately 198 units, so the total price would be $6,336,000. So, I mean, look, we're all going to make money. So price is important, you know. We, we like to believe in life that credibility is more important than price, but they go hand in hand. So price is the so, first thing that you yeah. look at. It's just really price. It, so yeah. if somebody's really lowballing, then you're just going to probably just put that in the bad pile and forget about it. Right. And in, 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 uh, in the situation we find ourselves right now in the marketplace, um, it's, it's picking up. Uh, apartment buildings are hot. So, yeah, so lowballing um, offers are not a good idea right now. And um, I also want to say that um, – Back to the, the sort of good pile and the bad pile idea here, that um, there probably are some knockouts for you as a seller. And and uh, it, one of the knockouts would be a low ball price. Are there any other knockouts? You see that in the LOI, and the LOI just goes in the bad pile? Sometimes people want to take too much time closing the deal. Um, I, I So I would disqualify. If somebody put like three or four months down to close the deal, I would be – more inclined to go with somebody who said they can close in 45 or 50 days. So, cause I have to hold the property. Once the seller signs his LOI, he's got a legal obligation to you. Mm -hmm. So he can't, can't take anyone else. And again, we talked about last week, um, don't start investing a lot of time until you get a signed LOI back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's another knockout. So you don't want to like try to give yourself all this time. And we're talking about decent buildings. If a building is really in bad shape and it's abandoned or it's right. other issues, then it's a different story. And you may need more time to line up financing and you may have to get bridge financing. And and, and that's a different story, right? Yeah. And if, if we can go into number two. Okay. So we talked about the importance of, of the price. And we'll, uh, we'll get, two. and we're going to, we're going to be talking about how to calculate a price and how to know the price. But Right now, we just want to mention it should be a, a, quote, good price, not a lowball price. Okay. Yes. And if I can just add to that, there's definitely a method to the madness for coming up with a price. And it's we easy. It's easy. We'll show you how to do it. Yeah. It's really, really easy. Okay. So number two, title considerations. Um, basically, um, what I would look for as a seller was how committed is this buyer? How much money are they going to put down? Um, and when will they put it down? So you can see right now, within two days of contract execution, buyer will deposit the firm's money in the amount of $50,000. So that's, um, quite frankly, so listen, everybody, we're talking about a big deal here. $50,000 is, is a low figure. This is probably going to go $100,000 to $200,000 earnest money. Now, we're talking about Casa Benita, 39-unit deal, but I'm showing an LOI that I just Yeah, wrote. keep this in mind. This is a 200-unit, 200 units, okay? This is a way different scale deal than the Casa Benita. But this just happens to be one that you're in the process of right now, so we just thought we'd talk about right. it right now. Um, so Absolutely. don't get put off by 50000 Your deal might be 5000 It might be fine, or 10000 So um, I want to make a point. So when you do put down some earnest money, you want to make sure it goes to the title company, and not to the seller. We talked about that last week as well. And the title company will protect your money um, into the terms of the contract. Um, so basically, I'm buying a lot of time here because even though I'm going to put down $50,000 in two days after they sign a contract, which might take a while, the process starts with the LOI, they sign, and then the seller will send you a contract, and you'll take your time with that contract. If we suggest you use an attorney. If you do it by yourself, you still can take five or ten days to go back and forth um, before you get the final draft of a contract. And, um, again, so once that's all complete, it'll go to the title company, and, um, you know, you'll put your five or $10,000 of earnest money down, and that's going to you, lead you into the due diligence period. Maybe now, we'll now I have to – I want to ask you about this, the, the biggie here. Right. Said earnest money will be non-refundable except in cases of seller's inability to deliver clear title. What if we're going to cover what happens if there's a problem with the property that, you know, some huge problem is discovered or whatever. We're going to cover that if, and, that, and so that they can get their money back if it's just a bad deal, it turns out. 
Yeah, so we call something like that carve-out agreements, and basically that will be in the contract everybody will learn more about. Um, look, we promise to give you this non-refundable money, but if we find out that you know, there's something wrong with the soil or there's something wrong that you didn't tell me or something fraudulent is going on, we get all our money back. So you do have some protections here. Yeah, remember, this so, is an LOI, a letter of intent. You're not giving them right. $50,000 in two days from today. You're giving them $50,000 after you've gotten a contract and you're ready to sign and it's signed. So there's a lot of in, ground between here and there. And in, and in that contract, you'll have a few more ways out. You know, you're not just kissing your money but goodbye if the deal blows up. So it's a big mistake intention. here for beginners yeah. is putting too many – uh, contingencies in LOI. You don't need them. Correct. We need you. Listen, we, we need, we need our, our listeners here to get past the LOI process. Congratulations. Fantastic. You send out an LOI. You're fishing. Okay. So someone, you know, take, you know, bites the hook, you caught a fish. Now you go back and forth with the contract. Once you get into that contract period, you know, the deal's not done, but the seller is promising to sell you the deal if you want it. So, okay, so now let's go on to number three, closing. That's pretty pretty clear. Um, closing to occur no later than, than Monday, June 24th. So, you know, again, these are all negotiable. So, but basically, what am I, oh, 45, thank you. So there we go. 45 days is becoming the norm right now to close a deal because you're going to need to have a survey done. You're going to need to have an environmental done, and you'll be working with your bank, and you'll be working with your broker, and they'll take you through the whole process. But it's going to take you probably, realistically, 20 to 40 days to go through that process. And you and you may not even care about those things. You should, but you may not. But the bank will require them to fund a loan, so you have to do these things. There's no choice. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely, because the, bank, the bank's in first position. The bank's lending the money. And the bank wants to make sure, you know, they're, you're not making any mistakes. And here's what's really interesting. What the bank is looking for is they're covering, covering their butts. And as long as a surveyor signs off with their signature, an environmental company signs off with their signature, well, that's an insurance policy. If anything goes wrong down the line, the bank has recourse against the person that signed those documents, that company, to rectify the problem and pay for it and fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, okay, that's number, yeah. Okay, well, that, no, so, that's good. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, number three, number four, real estate commissions. Look, that brokers get paid when they close deals. They don't get paid to show you deals. So don't forget that. Um, the seller shall compensate teller's broker with a real estate commission. So a lot of us are, are familiar with the way we buy and sell houses that we live in, or um, maybe some of us are not, but usually the seller pays, right, Richard? It's always the seller pays, which is sort of funny because the buyer forks over the money, but the sellers technically pays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and don't forget, and for our buyers listening, if you can get to a deal where there's no broker involved, you can use that as some leverage working with the seller. And the seller knows that, He's saving three to six percent on the total transaction by not using a broker as well. So maybe you both can split the commission fee. Now, in this case, the buyer doesn't have a broker. Is that unusual for these deals? Um, you know what? The, there is actually a this, there there is a brokerage company in this case. Um, so what, what I'm doing with this LOI is I'm submitting this LOI to a brokerage firm that's representing a bank. So um, in this case, there is a broker. So number four, brokers making sure that, you know, they're going to get do, do, But do you seller. have a broker? Is there like a co-brokers arrangement like there is in, um, in houses? You, you know where, um, where they kind of get you, Richard? Um, you have to find you have to sign a confidentiality agreement um, to even look at the deal, and in doing so, you're agreeing to the terms, which basically means you're not going to circumvent the broker. But what if you have your own broker who found this deal? How does your broker, let's call him uh, Fred, how does Fred get compensated? Oh, I see what you're saying. 
Um, normally, he would split the brokerage with the other side of the deal, the seller's broker. Okay. Um, but um, everyone who's listening right now, it's becoming more one-sided these days. Um, seller brokers aren't so quick to split commissions with buyer brokers. Am I confusing everybody? So in other words, if you have a buyer broker who finds you the deal, you may have to give your buyer broker some compensation uh, separately from this because he may not get any from the seller broker. Absolutely. And, and I, I've been part of those transactions before. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Number five. Exclusive opportunity. Following the execution of this LOI, seller will not negotiate or enter into discussions with any other party or offer the property. Um, so basically, the seller is promising to sell this property to you, which is why it's so important to get that signature on the LOI. So if you find a property, you're not wasting your time. I'd hate to see someone. I actually, I've seen it. I've seen people go into a deal, 40 days into the deal, everything's going as planned, but an LOI wasn't signed and the seller found um, a better buyer. Yeah. Made more money selling the property and he just, and, you know, so don't spin your wheels without a signed LOI. Mm-hmm. Now, confidentiality, that's pretty standard. That uh, Yeah. Okay. Now, let me do this. Let me clear the decks here and I'll go on to page two. This is a two-page LOI. Not too difficult. Not too complicated. Okay. So, number seven. Now, we got a little, little, a little bit more there. So what are we doing on number seven? Let me take a look at this property information. Upon execution of the LOI, seller will allow the buyer, buyer's representative, contractors, inspectors. So basically what we're doing right now is um, we're laying out the terms for due diligence, which basically we're laying out the terms for the buyer to get in there and look under the hood, see if, you know, how this motor is running and, and see if, you know, if it's everything the seller said it is. Are all the leases in order are are the boilers okay? Are the roofs okay? You'll send some contractors in there to give you some bids. Um, if you're working with a property management company, they'll do it for you. Um, for example, I am I own a property management company, and um, customers, buyers that come to me, they'll send my firm in there to do all the due diligence for them and take over the property. And we'll talk more about working with property management companies maybe next week if, um, or the week after. So you're just, you know, you're being promised a certain amount of time to do your inspections to see if you want to do the deal or not, number seven. Yeah, and that's really what this is all about because prior to a contract being executed, you're going to do due diligence. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, you mean before or after? Say that again. Yeah, before our well, contract, the, the actual contract is signed, you're going to do your due diligence as a buyer? Well, you're going to do semi due diligence. There's only, I mean, there's only so much you can do. Um, the owner's not going to want you in there looking at every single detail when you've made absolutely no promise to buy the property. But you're going to do your basic due diligence, like your drive-bys. Maybe you walk into the leasing office and pretend that you want to rent a unit, or you check out the area. So you're doing general, you're doing like a general due diligence. But once you sign that LOI, and once you sign that contract. Now it's time to roll up your sleeves and really create a budget to figure out what things are going to cost during the rehab, who's going to do what, and who's on your team, and put everybody to work. But your LOI gives you permission to go in and get rent rolls and all that stuff, even before a contract is signed. Yeah. The, okay. So the LOI will get you a lot of paperwork that somebody's going to email you. But the LOI isn't going to give you permission to go walk on the property with um, your team and start really taking things apart. Because it, it's just too, I mean, the, the owner of that complex doesn't want to spook all the tenants and let them think that, you know, that they're not going to do anything until the contract's signed. And quite frankly, um, owners are very sensitive mm -hmm. of, about showing the property until the contract's actually signed. You can walk on the property and, and browse through it. Once the, once the contract's signed, you can really start you know, looking at every single page. So basically, that says you can, but in reality, you're going to have to move to the contract to really get into it. Correct. And okay. you should move pretty quickly. You should be you know, less than a week. You should go into contract if you wanted to go quickly. 
if you still need to buy time, you can probably drag the contract process out two or three weeks. Okay. All right. And if you're going to draw the contract process out two or three weeks, it probably helps to go on the property and be making an appearance of putting an investment of your time and your people in because that probably says a lot about you instead of just sitting in your in your house. Yes. Yes. And um, it's a little game so at that point. It really is. And, and you, you know, maybe you want the owner to know so he knows how serious you are and your intentions to buy the deal. And you can see on the left-hand side, um, we graciously signed for the buyer side. And we'd love the seller to sign because once he signed, well, we said there's around 12 people going after the property. The other 11 are out until we perform or until we don't perform. Now this is a so, short. Um, this is a short form LOI. Um, this is just a very basic LOI. Um, who is going to draw this LOI up for you generally? Well, I've had brokers draw up LOIs for me in the past. They have a standard template. Um, I guess over the last few years, we've created our own. I'd like to um, see if we could put one up on your website so our members. Can just download templates for LOIs. Yeah, we'll do LOI, basic. but but um, I've also seen long form LOIs, which tend to be a lot more extensive. But before we get to that, this last paragraph talks about another agreement, a binding formal earnest money contract. Now, again, keep in mind this is for a very big deal compared to the deals that we're talking about. So, what's a binding formal earnest money contract? Is that just the contract, well, the purchase contract? It is. And, you know, again, we would probably, we, we would move that money over, you know, the $50,000 over pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, again, you really, you want the seller to sign that. And, again, there's nothing at risk. There's nothing at risk in this LOI un until we say it's at risk. So if you wanted to pull out of the deal, you could. But the good news is once that seller signs the deal, it's yours if you truly want it. And that's when it's time to get busy. That's when maybe you go to your investment club and, and you tell people about a deal. It's so much easier getting interest and raising funds and money and finding partners once you have an actual deal to talk about. Don't you think, Richard? Yeah, it's like essential. If you, you have a deal going on, you know, you, all kinds of people want to – you want to work with you. If you don't have a deal, it's just talk and you just can't really do anything. So, and you don't have to yeah, have a deal. Yeah. You just have to have something locked up with an LOI. That's a lot different. Right. So, um, we, I think, I think we've actually done a great job going over the LOI process and how important it is and, and what it really means to have a signed LOI as somebody who wants to buy a property. You're really, you're ready to go once you have this LOI. That's yours if you want it. So I know I get phone calls all the time from students about incredible deals, and, and I'm, I love to hear about them, and I'm really interested in those deals as well. But um, until they actually have a signed LOI, there's only so much time I can put into researching and analyzing uh, what the deals are looking at. Oh, so want to go into the commercial contract part now? Might as well just show this because it's a logical okay. – yeah. Okay. I hope everybody, everybody stands up, takes a breath, you know. <laughs> move around, but this is really important stuff. And there's only a few important aspects to this whole entire process, which can change your life, like it's changed mine and Richard's. So basically, um, we're just going to have a, there's only a few, a few pages here that we're going to show you right now. We're not going to go over it in detail right now, but uh, obviously there's the buyer and the seller and the property and the price. Now, Hey, if I can just if I can just add, um, and people say, where do you get these contracts? Um, this is a, just a typical Texas contract. Um, I didn't buy this contract. I didn't pay for it. I didn't create it. Um, this was a real simple transaction for us. We're back to the Casa Bonita story here. And um, again, I mean, some the brokers. And the title agency, the title company, they just came up with the contract. And you know, it's just a 13-pager. Okay, Richard, $925,000 um, was the beginning of the contract price here. Everyone can see number three, sales price, um, which you know, we just had to black out a few important parts of this contract that are personal. I don't mind sharing the sales price. It turns out we paid 950 
and that's because there were around a dozen people trying to buy this building, and someone stepped in with an all-cash deal to buy this deal, and I didn't have all cash. I was bringing a bank, so I had to step up and say, okay, I'll pay 950 It was well worth it. It's a great deal. So I paid $25,000 more. So there was a revision to this contract. So we were just talking about contracts going back and forth and buying up time, maybe giving you more time to line up your, your contractors. So that, that sounds, I, I probably got an extra week out of, out of stepping up and saying, I'll pay 950 And uh, was there a problem that, yeah. with the appraisal or the lender agreeing to that? Was there any difficulty? No, 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 not at all. Um, they were all happy to be part of the process and collect their fees. Uh, let me, it, let me, it, we're going to, when we talk about the pricing, we're going to show you how, yeah. how to come up with pricing. There's no such thing as it mattering what they ask for a property. What really matters is what the cash flow is on the property and what it should, what the purchase price is given that location and that type of property. The price is almost fixed by the market, not really by the seller. So you can make an offer on any property that you want and you don't, even though it's much lower than the, than the seller uh, is asked for, it really doesn't matter because it may just be an outrageous price that they asked for. And there's a certain way to calculate the price, which is really simple, which we'll show you. And then within a certain range, everybody's going to agree that that is the price of the property, you know? And, the, and uh, so that's, what's kind of different about this than a, um, than a, a residential deal because a property is purchased just like a bond. It's purchased for income. And every area has a certain level of income that, investors expect to get for properties in that area for that kind of property. It's really sort of set by the market. And uh, so even if the asking price is way different from what the property's worth, you could still do an LOI on it and you still have a realistic shot at it because it's all based on the income and the seller just may just be, you know, mis misguided about what they're asking for. So I'd encourage people to do LOIs even if the asking price is much higher than their LOI. What do you think about that, Alan? No, absolutely. I mean, again, the LOIs get you in the game. Um, you can't get a property without an LOI, and there's a lots of LOIs floating around out there. So I'd like to see our listeners send out one or two LOIs a week, and then you just work in your pipeline. So before you know it, you have 10 or 20 LOIs out there, and um, you know, you'll get a call from a broker, and, and they'll say your LOI has been accepted. It's up to you. You might say, well, I sent that out you know, four weeks ago. I haven't heard back from anybody. Um, you know, it's up to you if you want to say, okay, great, I'll take it, or I'm sorry, I found another deal, and you can move on. As far as um, the pricing we were just talking about, it, it is all about the cash flow. We keep, we keep, it's all about the cash flow. The bank, you know, your credit is, is not that important to the deal. Um, the bank just wants to make sure that the property can afford the money that's being lent on it. And uh, in this particular case, since it was across the street from the, it's across the street from the water, uh, land value has something to do with it. And I think there was like, I want to say 10,000 square feet of land and basically at $100 a square foot, I think that's a million dollars. I'm doing the math right. So that was like, land value down in that particular area is like $150 a square foot. So like, so the bank was really comfortable, not only on the I can't remember if it was five or ten thousand dollars a month cash flow. Imagine an extra five or ten thousand dollars a month coming in. I mean, for a lot of us, that would cover our bills each month. Mm -hmm. So the bank was comfortable with the cash flow level, and they were comfortable with the land value level as well because they can. The building was free, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the land was the, the land's worth a million and a half, and we're buying the apartment complex for a million dollars or nine hundred and fifty thousand. Well, apartment buildings pay you to own them. That's the whole point. They pay you to own them. <laughs> yeah. In this, yeah, in this you case, know. you had a you had another valuation, which is based on land value, which which really makes the deal super attractive. But sometimes you don't have that. Right. Uh, okay. So, so should we go on to the next page, or? Yeah. Yeah. Go to page two. Let's see what's done. All right. So I'm very curious, as we have people asking questions about <laughs> this. Yeah. Uh, Third-party financing, one or more, is not contingent upon buyer obtaining. Okay, this particular situation, 
an all-cash buyer steps in and says, Mr. Seller, I'll pay you $925,000 next week. Get rid of Alan Schnur. Because the seller didn't sign the LOI yet. Uh, and he could. So all I can say was, hang on a second. I'll pay you $950,000. Don't worry about the bank. I'm going to show up one way or another and forget about the $925,000 cash offer. So in doing so, I had a, I had a X out line one, which was is not contingent on the buyer obtaining third-party financing. I was, I, I was telling the seller, don't worry about my bank. Because the seller's worried. The seller's worried about the bank lending money on the deal, right. um, and he'd rather take the cash. So I had to convince the guy, the seller, to say, don't worry about it. I got it all taken care of. You know, he doesn't care if I have a great relationship or not, which I did. So I felt confident in checking that off. Okay. If you weren't so com- if you weren't so comfortable, you might want to check off item number two. If you don't, it, um, it's uh, upon buying and paying third party funding in accordance with the which which might the addendum might say line item two. If the bank doesn't lend, then I'm sorry, get in the praise out. Um, I want my earnest money back. And I'm yeah. not buying the deal. And a lot of deals are done that way. It's just that you happen to be in a spot where you felt that to get the deal, you had to give that up and you were comfortable with it because you knew the bank would make the loan. Right. There are plenty of deals that are being done with contingent on financing. It, but, you know, even if they are, you may want to hustle and get a bank behind you and, you, you know, pretty quick. And, you know, then you could tell your buyer you've already got a bank and, and they can you can get them to feel more comfortable with the deal. Hey, if I could just add to that. For example, last night, a local bank here in town was having a grand opening of a new branch. And they just invite everybody from the community. It's important to go to those kind of events if you want to reach out and meet, and meet bankers. I can guarantee you when a new community bank opens up that they need to lend money. So, you know, break out of your shell. Go to these, go to these, um, these grand openings and um, you just meet. You meet very successful investors from the community. You meet people that haven't done a deal. And you also meet all the bankers and the lenders. And um, look, we all have to start somewhere. And if you, if you don't feel like you have enough confidence to do something like that, let me tell you something. They're looking for you. They want you. So um, that's what I did last night. And I made, I made new contacts with a new bank. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them in my stack of people that I'm going to call next time I do a deal. Yeah. I want to also mention about banks now, you know, banks don't have to have like the money, you know, sitting there from people's savings to make loans. They can make any loans that they want. There's no longer any real limitation on that. And the uh, federal reserve has huge reserves that have printed money that they want banks to lend out. So the banks are highly incentivized to make loans. And um, so that's, that's why these are, hey. yeah. If I can just touch on B right now, because you see uh, it says assumption, Richard. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Um, assumptions are, are very common in the apartment business. You know, assumption meaning you don't need to go find new financing, and the financing that's on the building, on the complex, can be assumed by a new buyer, which is awesome. I love deals like that. So, I mean, that just solves a huge portion to the equation when the bank financing is there. And all you need to do is show up with maybe, you know, five to 15% down. You may have uh, to, uh, first, you still have to qualify yeah. for it, but it's a lot quicker and easier. That is correct. That is correct. And it's so common these days right now, um, lenders are charging like a 1% assumption fee, which is fine because you'd be paying that anyway on a new loan. Um, now, one of the things that, that, I, that I'm concerned about on assumptions is that the loan was made three years ago. Interest rates are much lower now, so it may not pay to assume a loan like that because the interest rates are much lower today, perhaps. You're right. Um, you're right. There are, so you have to be careful about what you're assuming. Um, maybe you're assuming something and you, want to, and you have the option to get rid of it. So maybe right now you're assuming something with an 8% loan on it. And, you know, you just want to get into the property mm-hmm. and you feel like maybe if there's a year or two left on the note, you can go out there and refinance in any way. I can tell you that I got into some assumption deals that worked out fantastic for me. It bought me the time. 
You know, I didn't have to use credit cards or hard money lenders. They were just they were just high loans. It bought me the time to turn around the property, fix the problems, make it more efficient. You know, drive that NOI, drive that cash flow, and then bring in a new bank and bring you know bring down that loan, the interest rate, and make more cash flow. So, you know, you have to be you have to be very clear on you know why you're assuming the debt, and if it's a high interest rate, can you can you bring it down by refinancing it? So that gives you a really, really strong potential turnaround because you can buy the property, turn it around, and then start making huge cash flow when your interest rate goes from 8% to 3.5% or 4% or whatever. I can tell you, not getting off subject, uh, I think the second deal I did was uh, an assumption deal that I, I, I ended up controlling a $2 million asset. It was a 76-unit building with like thirty dollars or $40,000 down through an wow. assumption, and then I refinanced that assumption out like a half a year later at a better interest rate. Wow. So that's on assumption. Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting on assumption. And then seller financing, more common um, in a difficult property or property with issues or uh, significant. Yeah, you have to be careful. You have to be careful with seller financing. I love it. I'm very interested in it. But the bottom line is you're solving someone else's problems. And can you afford to solve someone else's problems? And you're going to have to make that decision. Um, there's good seller financing deals and there's bad seller financing deals. Some deals just need to go next to the bank. Some deals need to go back to the bank. They just need to go back to the bank and then those deals need to be sold at a cheaper price to other investors. Other deals, maybe you can save them. Like I just told you about the assumption that I did. It was my second or third deal. Um, there were a lot of problems on the property. There were bad people living there, and there was a lot of deferred maintenance. Well, I got in there, I, I, I kicked out all the bad people, and I cleaned up the property, and you know, and then I got, you know, I, I got it on seller. If you want to call it assumption or shallow finance, but uh, the the loan was left there for me to do what I wanted to do with it. Be careful. Some property, some problems you can't fix, right, Richard? Yeah, some of them are. Well, you, some of them are. There's a reason that they're empty, or there's a reason that they're just right. sitting there on the market. And a, a big mistake that um, we can make is it's kind of a greed mistake. Is when we see something that looks like an outrageously good deal and nobody's after it. Well, there's probably something they right. know you don't know. Right. There's something called defeasance. I'll talk about it for one minute. Um, defeasance is when there's financing involved from a lender that that won't let the loan go away without a, pre, a huge prepayment penalty. For example, um, if there was a deal that was locked into a defeasance um, and I would go in there and buy it, if I didn't want to assume the loan, the seller would have to pay the interest back to the original lender um, and make up for their loss of interest. So what is that, that called again? Defeasance. Defeasance. Okay. And that would be D E F E A, something like that. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Something like that. The feasance. So, um, yeah. So the lender will, will, the lender will let the loan go away from the original owner, but they want to be made whole on the interest that they won't collect. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's, um, you know, that's why there's a lot of seller finance deals out there. The original owner wants to get out, but he's got a lender that you know wants to be paid off before he does get out. Yeah, well, some of and these loans, mean, yeah, yeah, they they the lender's expecting a they have an investor, and the investor bought the loan, and they're expecting a pretty high return, and they're enjoying getting eight percent when right. And so um, you're gonna have to buy them off one way or the other, and so that's why sometimes these things are seller finance. That's very interesting. And what they and what they do is the. the um, the original owner has to go out and buy a treasury with a particular yield and, and gift that to the lender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. To give the lender the, the ongoing interest that they would have missed out yes. on otherwise. Yes. So it's part of yes. the purchase price, basically. It becomes part of the deal. Yeah. But, you know, so listen, that's not the end of the world. You, uh, you can make those deals work as well, too, if you just figure out how to solve the problems on the property. And the debt is the debt, and maybe you can decrease expenses somewhere else and have a winner.
So there's good things and there's bad things. Be careful with the fees and some seller financing. But for sure, you really can get into a deal, no money down. So what we're going to talk about next time is we're out of time this week. We're going to talk about uh, okay. closing and the due diligence process, what it's like, how you do it, what you need to do to make sure that this goes from LOI and purchase contract to actual closing, and then how to get out if there's some problem and how do you know that you should get out. Um, and then if we are, so we're, we're going to be focusing on that next time. And if I can add to next time, so I have a, uh, an interior designer. She came up with a plan for Casa Bonita, and I've handed off those plans to the contractor that I hired, and they're going to start painting the exterior of Casa Bonita so we can share everybody some before and after pictures and um, how much value I think I'm creating. We can talk about the rehab process a little too. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks so much, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. We'll see Have you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.